What's up everyone, my name is Joe and this is Different Take. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and remember to click the bell so you don't miss out on any new content. I did a Girl on the Third Floor Explain video part one that I'll put a link to right here where I talked about the basic general themes of the movie, but now we're gonna dig a little deeper and get into the things that I couldn't get into in the first video. Let me know down in the comments below if you have any theories or if you picked up on anything that I missed. The film's theme is cause and effect, but what is the cause and what is the effect? That's where we find what the movie is really about. It's about toxic masculinity and the effect that it has not only on yourself, but on others around you. Let's take a look at the characters and what they represent real quick before I get into anything about the movie. Don represents toxic masculinity. If you look at Don's character and his character's behavior, you'll notice that what he does is he tends to feel that he's owed something. He's owed whatever he desires and anything that he wants he feels like it's owed to him and he just takes it. He just takes, 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 takes. Even if it comes at the expense of other people, it doesn't matter to him. He never feels apologetic. He never feels any remorse and he never takes responsibility for his own actions. He never takes accountability for the things that he does. He says things like, I earned that and you owe it to me. Don has this false sense of overconfidence and this false bravado that he can't even see past his own weaknesses. He can't see when he needs help. Liz represents women who hold themselves back and put their needs second to support the fragile egos of their partners. Sadie, the disfigured girl, represents the victims of childhood sexual abuse. Sarah represents the disposability of sex workers. Ellie is the conscience of the story. She's the moral sense. Milo and Cooper the dog are both innocent victims of circumstance. And I know what you're thinking. Why did Milo and Cooper have to die? But we have to remember, Sarah and Sadie were innocent as well. If you get upset because of Milo and Cooper's deaths, but you weren't as upset with Sarah and Sadie's deaths, or you just forgot, well, that hits on some of the points this film is making. The point that we have to start treating women with equal respect. And last but not least, the house. The house is a symbol for a woman. There's plenty of suggestive hints and symbols and we constantly hear moans in particular situations throughout the entire film. So as I'm going along, I'll refer to the house as a she just to keep the idea fresh in our minds. The opening shots of the movie are of different parts inside the house that are symbols that represent an old, tired, fed up woman. Kudos to production designers, I'm probably gonna mess up their name, Courtney and Hilary Andrewar. Andrewar, if I get it wrong, I apologize. But they did a stellar job with these symbols in the house. I won't go through them all, but if any of you out there have any ideas on what you think that these symbols mean, drop them down in the comment section below. Okay, so there's a shot of a ceiling lamp that looks like a nipple. There's a shot of an intercom system with a knob and buttons that control, ready for this? The volume, when to listen, when to talk. Think about that. Oh yeah, and we find out later on that those controls are broken, so. In one of the last shots, we see a light fixture that resembles a woman's, well, let's just say you can figure it out. Don comes bursting through the front door with this false sense of bravado. He's got his brand new little box of tools and he thinks that he's gonna renovate this house and... How about new? He walks in the house and he can't turn the light on. so. Don can't turn her on. Hmm. <laughs> then he says, who paints a room pink? Because I'm so manly, I can't like pink. Don sees a hole and puts his hand in there. And if you listen closely, you can hear the house moan. Then, without any precaution, he starts hammering the hole without having any idea of what the hell he's doing. Sound familiar, ladies? And then we see Don taking out all the carpets of the house, leaving her completely bare. In the main shot, you'll also see these big drapes in the background. This shot is a reference to the saying, do the carpets match the drapes? If you don't know what the saying is, just Google it. So without any care or caution, Don is modifying her to his liking. Oh no, he didn't. The doorbell rings and we get introduced to Ellie. Before the conversation ends, Ellie tells Don, my door is always open if you care to learn more. Remember that. Don then begins to video chat his wife, Liz, and we get introduced to Liz in a little small itty bitty screen. During the conversation, Liz points out the giant gaping hole in the wall, interesting choice of words. Don calls his unborn daughter Pumpkinhead and assumes that because Liz's stomach is so big that the only explanation is because she must have a big head. Yeah, or maybe because she has an entire human being inside of her, jackass. Liz asks about bringing in some professionals for the house because it's a lot of work. And Don dismisses Liz and says, I got this. <laughs> 
Nope. No, you don't. But if you look at Liz's response, she's supportive, but she's kind of skeptical. Then Don says, how could he sleep at night knowing someone else built her castle? It takes a man to do something like that. It's easy. You close your little eyes and you rest your little head. What are you trying to prove? Let go of the pride, man. Call in the help. Liz then says, well, at least the roof wouldn't leak. Ah, see? Common sense. Smart. Don tells her not to be paranoid. Ooh, ooh, never, never say that. Never say that. And Liz says, I trust you. <laughs> why, why would you, why would you do that? Liz has to go and says, I love you, and gives Don some kisses through the phone. And Dickhead McGee just smirks and hits end call because he's too manly for love and kisses. After the call, Don gets a power drill and stares down the hole like he's about to challenge the damn thing to a match in the main event at WrestleMania. Don's drill goes limp. 4.3 million men experience erectile problems. And his battery dies. But instead of getting mad at himself for not preparing to charge the damn thing, he gets mad at his drill. Don't blame the drill, Donnie. We then see some fluids coming out of the outlet of the wall and Don steps on a marble and gets, you guessed it, angry. See, the house, she's testing him and we're starting to see his flaws. Back in the house, Don starts smashing holes in the wall again. Why? <laughs> Who the hell knows? Then he starts to put his hand in the hole. Again, and if you listen closely, you can hear the house moan again. Don goes to a local bowling alley and bar to grab something to eat, where he meets Gary, or Gary, or I don't know, I guess that's how you pronounce it, who, after finding out which house Don's moved into, gives a look of concern and asks him if he was queer because the house is bad news for straight men. Note Don's reaction when he asked him if he was queer. Relax, dude, it's not that big a deal. Don goes back to the house and video chats with Liz again. And Liz asks again, again, if he needs extra help. And Don says no, because he has his friend Milo coming. Right before bed, Don watches some porn on his phone and he's watching this stuff where they keep saying daddy and it says daddy master on his phone and they'll do whatever he says and I, I don't know. I guess to make Don feel like he's in charge. <laughs> hey, whatever helps you sleep at night, I guess. Don makes a mess with the sink, goes outside and encounters Sarah. Gets a little flirty with the eye contact, then goes for a run. While running, he smiles at a woman walking by, and once he passes her, turns back to check her out. Jerk alert! Don gets in the shower, and the house blasts him right in the face with some white stuff. <laughs> I think you can all figure out what that was supposed to mean. That's all I have to say about that. Don paints over the pink room and almost immediately regains his manly superpowers. Who knows, maybe pink paint is his kryptonite. Don looks out the window and sees Ellie sweeping across the street. You look at his face, it looks like he wants to talk to her, but ultimately chooses not to. Chooses to drink a beer instead. Don looks outside and sees that Sarah is with Cooper the dog. And then Don invites Sarah in the house. And Don sleeps with Sarah and cheats on Liz. Again. The next day, Don wakes up, goes down the steps, sees Cooper, and Cooper just gives him this look like, you're wrong, dude. You're wrong. Don looks at Cooper and says, I earned that. You didn't earn shit. He's acting like he's owed something, that he has earned to do something like that. It's not how it works. Right after that, the ceiling in the room upstairs collapses. While Don is showing Liz to a video chat, Liz says, I don't understand how you missed this during the appraisal. Instead of taking responsibility, Don takes the opportunity to blame Liz as well. He says, you were here too. You can act like a man. What's the matter with you? What a guy, huh? Liz wants to call the real estate agent. Smart. Don doesn't. Mm. Liz doesn't want him to bite off more than he can chew. He does. Sarah stops by and asks to come in, and Don all of a sudden says he can't. I'm sure you understand. Where was that answer before you slept with her, jackass? As expected, Sarah looks a little upset. Next day, Don is walking down the stairs. He answers the door and Milo is finally here and sees that Don is completely ill-prepared to renovate the house after seeing how many tools he has. While they're working on the house together, Milo mentions that he needs a Liz of his own. Don says to Milo, if he wants to get a Liz of his own, it's a bad idea if he's afraid of hard work. What hard work? Wh what are you? What are you talking about? What? She does all the work. You're lucky she's still with you. Milo sticks up for himself and reminds Don that he's holding a heavy ass piece of drywall and helping him out for free. After they're done working on the house for today, they go to the bowling alley bar. When they notice that there's not a lot of women around, Don asks, aren't there any colleges around? All right, prank. Unbelievable. You're too good for him, Liz. During the conversation, Milo says that he's a feminist. The next day they wake up and they're working on the house. Don asks Milo to swear he won't say anything to Liz about last night because he promised he wouldn't drink. 
Broke his promise, but okay. And Milo says, bro code, bro. Ah, yes, the old bro code. What a bunch of made up macho bullsh. Sarah is brewing a pot of coffee in the kitchen. Don gets pissed, grabs Sarah by the arm, and then when he tries to call her by her name, Don doesn't even remember her name. Jerk alert. He says to Sarah, it's my life, and he doesn't ever want to see her around here again. Uh. It's her life too, or did you forget that, Donald McDickinson? Milo checks to make sure everything is all right, and then confronts Don about what just happened. Don says that Milo's overreacting, just like he accused Liz of being paranoid. Don says he messed up and he didn't even want it. It just happened. Oh, yeah, I didn't want it. Oh, look, it just so happened that I invited Sarah into the house. It just so happened that when she kissed me, I kissed her back. It just so happened I closed the bedroom door behind her. We just so happened to be having sex. W would you look at that? Hey there, fella. How did you just so happen to get in there? How the how, how does that happen? Am I an unpractical joker? What's, ha what's happening? I didn't even want it. I didn't even want it. It just happened. I'm calling bullshit. Milo gives Don the riot act and tells him how Liz is busting her ass while Don is trying to recapture his glory days. And then Milo says, when are you going to start thinking of someone other than yourself? Good for you, Milo. Telling him like it is. Don says it is what it is, and if you can't handle it, then don't be here when I get back. You son of a bitch. A dick. Milo begrudgingly stays. Milo encounters Sarah. We always know what happens here. Then Ellie visits and asks Don if he wants to talk about it. And Don looks like a pouting five-year-old who just had his iPad taken away. No, I'm not talking. In this scene, Don represents men who have trouble expressing their feelings or communicating what's going on in their head. They clamor up and shove their feelings down because they were taught all their life that men don't express feelings. Burr, burr, burr. But eventually it's got to come out sometime and one day it comes out as something stupid. You're at a Target and they don't have the toothpaste you want and you're sitting there like, oh, come on, this is bullshit. Where's the advanced whitening gel? There's no toothpaste, the house is messed up. Ah! The takeaway? Communicate. When talking to Don, Ellie refers to the house as a she. She says, when a woman gets to a certain age, she doesn't like to be fussed with too much. Houses aren't that different, I guess. This house is a bitch. Certain places have personalities and sometimes they're rotten. It takes a real strong hand to turn them around again. What's interesting about this moment is that if you look at Don, he immediately looks at his hands, balls his hands up into fists, and then starts hitting his fists as if he immediately took that as strength with violence, toughness, force. She's a pastor, Don. That's not what she meant, dude. What she was talking about, Dickelstein, was strength of character. Ellie then says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. In other words, we gotta keep our composure! We gotta just keep our composure! Cooper the dog follows another damn marble down the steps and becomes the next victim, unfortunately. Don calls the cops about Cooper. I talked about this in the other video. As the cop is leaving, Don is seen on the porch by Ellie. Once again, Don doesn't go to Ellie for help. Sarah shows up, and I talked about this in my first video as well. It was all just a trick Sarah and hit her from behind, and he goes to bury her body in the walls of the house. Dude, what? What the f- while Don is doing this, he receives a call from Liz. Then Don has a temper tantrum and acts like a kid at Toys R Us, and the funniest thing in the movie happens. He rips off the cabinet door, throws it across the room, it bounces back and whacks him right in the head. I don't know if it was a mistake, but either way, it's goddamn hilarious. So he freaks out on Liz, throws a complete toddler temper tantrum, and it's not because he's upset about Sarah or Cooper or Milo. It's because he's afraid he's about to get caught. You selfish bastard. Then Sadie comes after him and Don asks, why are you doing this to me? Liz shows up to the house and we finally get to see Liz full screen. If you really look at how Liz's character really comes through the screen, she's on a little itty bitty screen on Don's phone and she has no voice. It's through the phone. It's almost as if it's saying, once Don is out of the picture, that's when we get to see who Liz really is. Because we've been seeing Liz through Don's perspective the entire time. But note the thing that Liz wanted most was the kitchen to be done and Don couldn't even do that. and just shows it wasn't on his priority list, and neither was Liz. She looks at the lady part lamp, and if you notice, she gently touches it. 
which is the opposite of what Don does. Dude's just making holes with this entire house. Sarah shows up, Liz meets Sarah in an awkward conversation. Just when things could get really bad, Ellie shows up just in time. And it's very clear that Ellie does not want to go in the house. Ellie says to Liz, this house has a history of bringing out the worst in people. Liz says, it's a lot of work, but it's not bad. Ellie says, you really don't know until you start tearing a place up. It sounds like they're talking about a person. While in the house, Liz is a little freaked out and she repeats to herself, I am in control of my emotions, which is the exact opposite of what Don was doing, because he wasn't. She gets freaked out and then she finds Don's phone. And note, she does not hesitate. Liz immediately goes to Ellie for help. Don did not know how to ask for help. He never went to go ask for help. That's one of the main differences between Liz and Don. And Liz admits to Ellie that her husband's a fuck up. Ellie straights up asks her, why'd you stay? And Liz admits the alternative seemed worse. So she was afraid. Talking about the house, Ellie says, some people make it, some people don't. It all depends on the character and the determination of the people moving in. Liz says, then we're screwed. So she knows Don has poor character, but she stays with him anyway. Mm. Ellie says, You want my advice? Get your husband and your baby far away from that house. Liz goes to find Don and goes back to the house, where the ghosts are partying like it's 1909. While making her way upstairs, Liz sees a woman down the hall who talks to her briefly. Her name in the credits is The Nymph. If you notice, The Nymph is kind of hiding. She's quiet. She stays in the background. Doesn't really say much. My best guess is that The Nymph represents women who are sexual or who enjoy sex. They sort of have to stay in the background and kind of hide it. And they're kind of forced to feel shame because of it, which is the opposite of what men do. Men get high fives, women get shamed. It's a weird system we got going on here. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got to this definition. In pop culture, a nymph is usually short for nymphomaniac. But when I looked up this word elsewhere, I found this definition. In Greek and Roman mythology, a nymph is a nature spirit in the guise of an attractive maiden. Nymphs often suffer the attentions of men, notably those of the gods. This might be another way to interpret the nymph character. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Yeah, get on with it. Now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Liz then sees the show with Sarah and the weird mask guy, and weird mask guy starts to take it a little too far. Sarah starts getting uncomfortable, she looks visibly scared, and then she starts getting hit so hard, she's visibly getting hurt. The whole time, the guys are watching in the bleachers and nobody's doing anything. Even one guy pops a bottle at the exact time that she's getting hit real hard. Liz finally yells, stop. She actually does something. If you look at Sarah's face, Sarah looks up and takes notice of what Liz did. Liz sees Sadie before before she was disfigured. And then we see Weird Mask Guy coming again with marbles. And if you listen closely, you can hear Weird Mask Guy saying, that's my girl. Remember that later on. Liz sees Sarah. We find out that Sadie was buried by the train tracks. We find out that Sarah was killed and she was actually buried within the house. And even though the whole town loved Sarah, nobody went to go look for what really happened to Sarah. If you haven't noticed by now, Don also tried to kill and bury Sarah in the walls of the house. So between Don and the Weird Mask Guy, it looks like we're starting to see some repetitive patterns and toxic behavior. Sarah says to Liz, all men really love is the power you give them. This is an example of what happens when you treat women the way that you do. You get anger, you get resentment, you get backlash. It doesn't come from nowhere. You can't just be sitting there going, why is she so angry? She's so vicious. I just don't understand where it's coming from. Yeah, well, now you know. Sarah poses as Don and tests Liz and taking Don back again, thinking he could change again. I talked about this in the other video. Liz goes to leave. Then she sees Sadie bursting through the wall, almost like she's being born. Like the house birthed this disfigured girl. Sadie looks up. She's not there. You look to the right. One of the best scenes in the movie. And Liz goes, nope. Liz goes outside and sees Ellie on the porch and they have a conversation. It explains the whole premise of cause and effect. That conversation also gives you a hint at Ellie possibly being a ghost. I don't know for sure if she's a ghost. That was just my guess. But when Ellie says, I can't keep anyone out of this house more so than they could keep someone out of mine. That is an unusual way of saying what she said. It just sounds like Ellie has no control over who goes into her house as well, which means that it's very possible that Ellie could be a spirit as well. Just a good one. Liz says it's a messed up game and Ellie says, I didn't make the rules. That'd be the Lord. Jesus. Jesus, yeah, Jesus. It's tricky like that, Jesus. Liz goes back in the house, finds Sarah's body and goes with Ellie to give her a proper burial. Fast forward six months later, Liz is still in the house. We see Liz is safe and sound with her newborn baby. Then we see Don, or the spirit of Don, looming over the crib. And Don says, 
that's my girl. It's the exact same thing that what weird mask guy said earlier in the movie. Not only that, it's Don's voice in both scenes. Why is Liz still there after Ellie clearly told her to leave? We can make a strong case, and I think it's very probable this is the ending that Travis Stevens wanted. That Liz is staying in the house because she's not afraid of Don anymore. Even if he is there, she's not afraid. She's not afraid of the house. Even though it's dangerous for her and her baby, she'll confront it and she'll take it head on. She's not gonna be forced to leave her house and she's not gonna be pushed around. I think the idea is that Liz should not have to be afraid of Don anymore or that women should not have to be afraid of men anymore. We should be able to talk and communicate and be in relationships and marriages and work together and not have one be the dominant one and all that sort of stuff, the power dynamics. That's essentially what Travis Stevens, I think, is trying to say. That these power dynamics are toxic to the relationship, they're toxic to marriages and everything else. This movie is not saying that men are bad or that all men are bad. It's saying that women should not have to be afraid of men. It's saying that men shouldn't act like those particular men, that kind of behavior should not exist. I think it challenges us to take a look at that particular past behavior and recognize that behavior, recognize the effects that it has, change that behavior, and move forward. If you liked my deeper explanation of growing a third floor, remember to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you, Selena. Take it away.